get to start talking about start get to start talking about hill slopes and diffusive processes. This is our mass movement one, I guess, your sort of first segment of mass movement. Where we'll be talking about diffusive processes, our second uh, go at mass movement will deal with landsliding and a bit of uh, debris flows as well. So, let's get right into it. On Saturday, we have a field trip, and I heard somebody guaranteeing me good weather. So, this is, you know, I've shown you these before. We're going to go to these soil profiles, which are in road cuts. So we don't have to dig pits or anything. And here I'm just highlighting the difference in the thicknesses of the soils. Here we've got four and a half meters. Here we've got 0 0.2 meters of mobile regolith above bedrock. And here the rock is saffrolite, you know, pretty crappy for a bit above the hard rock. And those two spots are in these two places. One over here at the edge of this relatively subdued topography area here at the, this the south fork of the All Sea River. And then over here we've got this pretty sharp ridge, although it's there's a there is a cat road that goes down here, so I think it's a little bit dull by that, but you can see up here the, the ridge is pretty sharp there. And just based on what we know about these two sites then, we know that, the, that this area, the subdued topography, is pinned behind a couple of waterfalls. We can infer, therefore, that it is lowering at a relatively slow rate compared to this much higher relief area down here that seems to be eating into that spot up there. And so one of the things that we can see just from this uh, map from the LIDAR is that the ridges in the, in the, where the, at the ridges of the topography where it's lowering much more quickly, those ridges are sharper compared to these broad ridges in the area where the lowering rate is much small. So, uh, one of our big question then for looking at diffusion, diffusive processes on hill slopes, is going to be something along the lines of trying to answer the question of how do we know, you know, how do we, how can we infer one thing from another? Specifically, um, how do we get from, say, proposition or point A that what I will talk about mainly today, that soil flux is roughly proportional to slope, that is the, to the topographic slope. How do I get from that to the second bit where the landscape lowering rate is proportional to the sharpness or the curvature of those ridges. So I'm not going to try to do that all at once, but we'll try to get there by by the end of the week. Uh, what I'm going to start with today is trying to convince ourselves of this first part that soil flux or mobile regolith flux is proportional to the topographic slope. And we'll start with We'll start with a process that we already know something about, uh, which is frosty. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about or go through how we can get something like this out of just simple observations about frost heat. Um, I say you know about frost heat because you know about frost cracking. And in trying to teach you about frost cracking, I showed you a bit of the video with Mr. 1950's narrator with this experimental setup. And you might recall they had this, you know, they had the cylinder, and they were freezing the soil in the cylinder, and it was making ice lenses, and the top of the soil was, was going up because of that. Um, so what I want to do is, at least conceptually, I'm not going to try this physically, but conceptually, let's take that cylinder and tilt it at an angle. So if I have my frosty cylinder here, and remember I had a water source at the bottom and cold up here at the top, <coughs> uh, I'm going to do something a little bit differently from what they did in the video, which is I want to go ahead and fill it all the way to the brim with that soil. And so that we've got here my initial soil profile, or soil surface that is. And then we'll, we can, now let's grow some ice lenses in there. So if we do that, if we, if we grow those ice lenses, then what happens to the soil? It moves up, right? It's, it's confined by the walls of the cylinder. It can't expand sideways. There's stuff down here. It can't expand downward. So all it can do is it can expand normal to the slope. So let's pretend you know things work out really nicely and it doesn't collapse while it's freezing, <coughs> but I've still got you know ice lenses in here. And so here I've got uh, my soil surface after the heaving has taken place. So it's been heaved, my heave pressure has, has grown these ice crystals. Um, you know, if, let's, let's think about that, make sure we, we buy that. But if, that I'm figuring that if you believe that I can, that, uh, that the heave pressure from ice growing into cracks in rock can actually crack the rock, then it can also push soil up. And you saw, you saw that, of course, in the in the video. So we've got this, let me draw in an arrow for the displacement here of that surface. So the surface is moved up after heave. And then let's say I'm going to uh, turn off the freezer and open the lid and let the whole thing thaw out. And what's going to happen then? Well, the ice is going to melt. Duh. Um, but what about the soil here? Is it's not going to shrink back into the into its column nicely and neatly? Um, you know, say stuff out here is going to fall pretty much straight down. And I'll let me just for clarity draw a surface that's level with that the top of that cylinder. So stuff here is going to fall. You know, some of the stuff's going to fall back into the cylinder, of course. Um, but in general, you know, if I draw just a, sort of a displacement, you know, it's, it's going to go straight back down. And there's going to be some net displacement along the slope. So, well, there's going to be some net displacement. I'm going to have stuff that falls out here, and so I'm actually going to lose some mass from my cylinder. Now, you might imagine if I had, if I just had cylinders after cylinder and so on, 
I might gain as much from upslope as I got as I'm giving downslope. But in this case, where there's nothing coming in from above, my cylinder is going to lose a bit of mass. Okay, that's nice. Um, in order to go a bit further with this, though, um, I want to try to clarify a bit how my displacement changes with depth, or what that depth profile looks like. So here's an experiment uh, where they filled this sort of big trough kind of thing full of earth material. Uh, and they put in some tiles originally stacked vertically as markers for the displacement. And they did a bunch of freezing and thawing and then dug out the side of the trough to show us up, you know, up to the, the marker tiles to show how the displacement has varied with depth. And you can see that, that it is much more displaced at the surface than it is at depth where the, depth, the displacement appears to taper off to nothing. We can also look in nature. Uh, here's just a handy uh, placement of tilted layers in the in tilted strata where we can see that they're displaced leaning over at the top. Um, trees provide us a good indicator that something's going on and and from a bit of reasoning, looking at how the trees are displaced, how they're bent, we can figure out something. So if, I, if this tree, for example, is, is bent over like that, um, well, what happened? I mean, trees in general do grow straight up. But if my tree, my, and it must have been much smaller then, if my little tree is anchored at some depth, but then the surface is displaced, then that tree is wimpy enough to, to move along with that displacement, then the tree is going to get bent over. Right? The whole thing isn't going to move along if it's displaced, if the roots are anchored down where it's not, where there is little displacement. So the tree gets bent over, and then eventually it sort of grows straight up uh, and becomes strong enough to, uh, to stand up to the bullying soil trying to displace it all the time. Um, but this is, around here, uh, we only see these sort of pistol-butted trees uh, at the top of Mary's Peak, which is where I took this picture. And this is uh, just FYI, you know, if you go to Mary's Peak, you drive all the way up as far as you can drive, and you walk up the road to the top, there's a road cut along there that, where I took this picture. So if we kind of sketch out what's going on here. I start with some initial uh, moist soil and I put in some tracer blocks. I do some initial freezing and as I go deeper, even if I freeze equally to, uh, to some depth, the amount of displacement that any of these blocks gets is going to be an inter is going to be the sum of all the ice lenses below it, or deeper than it, right? So the the top one moves the farthest up. So if I just draw in there a couple of arrows, one at the surface, one at some depth, um, the top one has more ice lenses, so it moves farther relative to one that's deeper, which doesn't move very much, and then they fall. Um, and after, say, seven of those similar cycles, I would have something like, something like a displacement profile like that. All right. So, let's step through that then. Um, let me, just to have it be uncluttered, draw a hill slope surface. It, uh, 
say that it is tilted at an angle theta. <coughs> and I've got at the surface, I've got, say, this amount of displacement, which I'll call that magnitude h. And as I get, as I go lower, these arrows get shorter. So I've got some depth of freezing. Call it zeta, which is what it's the notation used in the book. I'm going to try to stick to the notation in the book to avoid confusion. Uh, zeta just is kind of, I draw just like kind of a squiggle. I mean, maybe I can make that a little better. No, still just comes out a squiggle. All right. Um, all right, so. I've got that amount of heave. It then moves straight down. And it does that all the way down here. Just smaller and smaller. And so I've got this amount of net, this net amount of displacement right there. That in. Similarly, as I go down. Now, if that's h and that's theta, what's the magnitude of that arrow? It's just trig now. Maybe it helps if I turn that, if, if I point out that that angle is also theta, and I turn it on its side, that's h. That's my angle theta. Then that one right there is the sine, right? H sine theta. So my displacement at the surface is H sine theta. Yes, Jim? Um, what is H? Oh, never mind. Yeah, just, let me just write it though. That's just how much it expands. Yeah. at the surface is H. So what are we solving for then? Uh, we wanted to know this net downslope displacement. This one here. So if that's my angle theta, then the Y component is, is the sine. Wouldn't H be not the hypotenuse though? No, H would be the hypotenuse. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. All right. Dang. Okay. Yeah, you're totally right there. So you want to use tangent? Yeah, I'm gonna have to use tangent. This is what they did in the book, but I thought they were just taking a shortcut. Okay. Yeah. So if that's if that's H. Yeah. Then uh, this part is ten. Good catch. Yeah. Good one. Okay. Well, that, that makes that means uh, that makes one less approximation we'll have to use as we go forward. Um, okay. Let me let me do my sketch a bit so I can write below here. Um, so that's my displacement at the surface, the, my net downslope displacement. Um, if I wanted displacement volume for this, for say this one frost heave event,
then I need to essentially figure out the area of this triangle. Okay, so I know that the area of a triangle, so that, yeah. yeah. So basically it's the, the area, the displacement volume is going to be the area of that triangle times some increment into the board dy. And we'll dispense with that soon enough, but all right, so the area of that triangle is one half base times height. So my volume is one half. Base is this uh, zeta. The height is h tan theta. Okay. Yeah. Why would you? Uh, uh, sure. Doesn't matter. Right. It's a right triangle. Whatever I, I can call what something the base. I can call the other the height. It's all the same. Well, I mean, like what depth. Of So what I'm what I'm looking at is how what is my um, volume of downslope displacement? So I've got this depth of freezing. I'm gonna if I so here we get to the next point that that h is gonna be the depth of freezing times the strain that we get from the freezing. Yeah. Just say don't include h. No, and it is not included. We only use H to find the, let's just say, X component of it. That's the only time H came in. But we're thinking about the depth component, the volume of Earth in the ground, which is C, and then H related at the top. But H doesn't really have anything to do with it. Well, it, so H comes in when we want to know <laughs> Um, when we want to know that lateral displacement, we need to know how much it's gone up. And then when it falls straight back down, we have to do our trig here. That's corrected that that's going to be h times tan theta. Um, so that gives us that side of the triangle, and then the zeta is the depth. And what we're wanting to do is, OK, we know it heaves, and then it drops. And after all that, how much, what's our volume of of downslope displacement. Okay. Um, now, H, that surface displacement, like I said, is going to be some amount of strain. Say that you know, if we if we have. Uh, if our ice lenses amount to like an additional 10%, then our strain here would be 1.1. Okay. So our, that's our strain times the freezing depth. Now, not 1.1, it would be 0.1. So the, so the amount of strain is going to be you know, the additional fractional uh, depth that we have at when it's heat. Okay, so like again, if we add 10% volume of ice, then beta would be 0 0.1. And that therefore H, that's our freezing depth times that beta, 
Okay, and if our, say our freezing depth was a meter and we had 10% ice upon heave, then we have 0.1 times a meter and that H would be 10 centimeters. And then we multiply that by 10. Whoa, sorry. Um, so with that, I can get that the volume displacement is 1 half times, well, OK, let's see. We've got a beta times zeta here in front of my tan theta. I've got another zeta here. So that means I've got a, oops, got a beta. I've got a zeta squared and a tan theta and a dy. Okay. Now then, let me move back over here. Instead of trying to cram everything into that corner over there. What else can I do? I can, well, tan theta, I don't really want to leave it like that. Um, but if my, if I make some axes like that, that's my x and that's my z. The tan theta is going to be dz dx, right? Tan theta is the slope of the surface. So now, one another thing is. I need a negative sign in there because my displacement is down slope and if I just look at, if I just do a dz dx, actually that's not going to turn out right. That's, that would, if I'm looking at my volume of displacement, I don't want to be under the impression that it moves up slope. So I'm going to have to uh, use a negative sign. That's just, again, knowing that I'm not moving stuff uphill, I'm moving stuff downhill, and if I want to be, I get the math right, I've got to use that negative sign. So if I look at the, a single event flux, then uh, flux, uh, let's see. That's going to be my displaced, I'm going to represent that as displaced volume. in what I wrote all the way over there. 
but also with my dz dx or my negative dz dx instead of tan theta. Okay. Ready, set, rho b theta over 2 theta squared and a negative dz dx for slope. Now, for what if I've got, well, that's, it's nice if I know it one time, but if I want to know it after a year or an average rate over many years, then what else do I need to know? I'm going to need to know about the frequency of events, that is, how many of say number of events per year. So let's just say little f is going to be number of events per year. And I also need to know something about how my, what, what's up with this depth of freezing? I don't necessarily expect that depth of freezing to be the same every time it freezes. Um, however, I can probably get away with uh, simply using a mean depth of freezing, which I'll just call zeta star. So then if I want my flux per time, then that's going to equal that F times my little Q. But the little Q is going to be with a the zeta star for my mean depth of freezing instead of this, this particular event. so-called diffusive processes. And so I'm going to want something with the units of a diffusion constant or a diffusivity. And so if I just define a diffusivity, and I'll stick with uh, kappa again. So I'm, multi 
I'm dividing out the bulk density there. So that means my mass flux per width is going to be minus rho b kappa dz dx. Or again, this is now my diffusivity. And it has units of length squared per time, as a good diffusivity should. And there we are. I've got th that uh, just by knowing something about just going through geometry and knowing that frost heave is a thing and that it displaces <coughs> stuff and that it must displace stuff outwards and then stuff falls back towards the center of the earth due to gravity. That I get a net displacement and add that up over time and I get a flux that's proportional to the topographic slope. That kappa has units of length squared per time, yeah. And this is a, a mass flux per time, per width. you all believe that, I mean, you don't need to necessarily follow every step of the math, it's just that just trying to convince you that simple geometric arguments, knowing something about frost heat can get us to this kind of expression and that kind of expression. We can do the same for other processes. Um, let's see, who wants to name me some diffusive processes, perhaps it might behave this way. Think of things that push Earth up out of the surface. Salt cracking. Huh. Guess we'd have to call it salt heaving though, wouldn't we? Salt heaving. I guess Theoretically, that could be a thing. Um, I've never heard anybody talk about it, and that might be because the only place like on the dry surface of the Earth that we're going to get enough salt to do that is going to be a flat lake bed. So it seems like, yeah, it could work. Um, but maybe maybe not too important for actual transport transport on slopes. Although, I don't know, it could, I mean, you know, maybe in some badlands it could be salty enough. But, yeah, I, I tend to think the conditions are just not going to be right for it. Not that it couldn't, not that it's impossible, but maybe just not on this planet. Um, Reasonable, though. What about like a raised water table or something like that? Like about that? There's that kind of a different type of process. Raised water table, you mean sort of a, like, a swelling? Yeah. Like that. I mean, we can, we, you know, it's, it's potentially shrink swell could get us a bit of that. I mean, we definitely get some eruptive. It wasn't one of the things that I was going to write down, but I'll go ahead and, I mean, I've seen in my own backyard, uh, got a little fault line in my backyard that opens up in the summer, and then in the winter, it not only closes up, but sometimes mud erupts out of it. So, yeah, I'll buy that. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, anybody ever notice, like, your garage door gets all dirty? Regardless of the fact that it's actually a vertical surface, what's up with that, right? It's 
So why is that? Why is your garage door or your screen door or whatever get get all dirty? Yeah, but wind wouldn't wouldn't make it stick, right? Rain splashing on dirt. Yeah, rain splash. So if you've got if you're maybe if you kept Maybe if I kept my driveway totally spick and span, then my garage door wouldn't get so dirty. But um, what with there being some dirt on my driveway, um, that rain splash is going to displace that dirt and splatter it. And that is a thing that we see, at least where uh, we've got bare soil under raindrops. Um, what else? Let's see. I mean, it was a reasonable thing for Brandon to think, you know, okay, well, let's see if frost crack cracking can make frost heave, and maybe salt cracking has salt, salt heave. Um, what other sort of weathering mechanisms might also contribute to diffusive transport? So maybe tree throw. Um, you know, we've seen, I've shown you the photos of, well, I, I'll show you one in just a second, um, of trees turned over with the boulders in them. Well, those trees turned over on slopes are going to move some of that stuff down slope, right? If I've, Got a slope, a tree growing in said slope, and it has a root mass, and said tree then falls over and uh, let's see, rips these roots up out of the ground like so, leaves a hole behind, and then as the roots decay, the stuff falls out and makes a mound here. Um, and should we just let vegetables have all the fun? I mean, what about, you know, things with brains? Gophers. Gophers, animals, ants, worms. So animal burrowing. Both vertebrate and not. So gophers, ants, worms, moles, I suppose. Do they have to be burrowing? Because like if the ants splash with it, then the use of process that would just by taking a step somewhere that also be Yeah, I suppose. I don't know that I mean people do sort of want to attribute all sorts of stuff to cows, so cows, you know, they, they blame some transport on cows I've seen. Uh, just sort of trampling along. Um, well, yeah, because a cow might have to feel that it rains a lot. Yeah. I tell you what, you know, it's it's like uh, with the rain splash and the tree throw and the burrowing, it's actually relatively straightforward for us to come up with stuff that comes out a lot like this did for the cow trampling. I don't know. So maybe that's the only reason I don't hear about cow trampling being a big deal. Um, let's go ahead and look at uh, look at a few pictures, though. Just so you know. Well, let's see then. Uh, so tree throw. Um, yeah, so there's the, there's the upended tree right there. Um, interesting to try to figure what's going on here. We've got the tree up, root up, root wad up there. You can see all the boulders in it. Uh, this is in the coast range. Um, and you can see the pit that's left behind and person for scale standing at the edge of the pit. Here it looks like that thing was torn all the way up and out of a hole. Um, might have already dropped a bit of mass outside of the hole there, I'm not sure. 
Um, here's a real blurry picture. Let's see what's that supposed to be. That's, I think, on Mary's Peak. Um, we can see a tree there and a root mass there, and maybe a bit of a pit there. Um, another one up here. Um, yeah, kind of blurry, but there it is. Ah, here we go. The lovable mountain beaver, aka Boomer. Um, they definitely reek some, they definitely move some soil. I don't know, they're not necessarily as uh, widespread all over the landscape like the trees are, but they definitely move some stuff around when, where they do it. Um, everybody know what a mountain beaver is? What the heck's a mountain beaver? That's a real thing. Uh, it's not a beaver. Um, I mean, it is a rodent, though. But it's a, I don't know, I've heard it referred to as a primitive rodent. I guess something that just means that it's, no, it's, it's not a new, What's it like making cake drawings? <laughs> I think all that means is that, like, you know, it's it's sort of relatively less evolved, you know, I don't know, how, whatever, like, it, it's, it's, its branch comes off early or something, or it's a representative of, of relatively, it's relatively similar, relatively less changed compared to early rodents than some other. They're kind of mean, aren't they? Oh, I don't know if they're mean. They're really shy, though. It's, yeah, it's kind of rare to see them. They're like big claws. So oh, yeah? My dogs look like claws. Really? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Uh, mountain beavers, uh, you know, so those in the coast range, but, um, you know, where we're going to go to, we're also going to go to Chip Ross Park on Saturday, and so we'll see and get to uh, uh, commune with some gopher mounds. Um, here's just some, uh, some data regarding rain splash. Um, and looking at a couple of different cases where we've got kinetic energy of the raindrops on this axis and the detached mass in milligrams on this axis, those milligrams per millijoule, um, and different trends for different amounts of soil moisture. So uh, increasing soil moisture in this one relative to this one. Um, yeah, so if you're, you know, for example, if, you're, um, if your soil is saturated already when the raindrops are hitting it, then you're going to displace more stuff than if it's not saturated. Because if it's not saturated, then you're still going to have some surface tension, sort of sucking the particles together, um, like so. So, um, so you know, we can we can just briefly think about what's going to give us bigger diffusivity. For example, well, in the case of the frost heave, um, you know, greater strain during freezing, more frequent frost events, uh, greater mean freezing depth, all those things are gonna give us bigger diffusivity. Um, for rain splash, if we've got more frequent rain, bigger drops, more drops, more easily, more easily displaced material, those are gonna give us a bigger diffusivity. For animals, if we got more animals and they're more active and they're and the, say the soil is more diggable, or they're just burlier animals, um, then greater diffusivity. Uh, for tree throw, we have more trees, bigger trees, faster growing trees, more wind events, and stronger wind during wind events, then in general we're gonna get bigger diffusivity. Um, also, again, if the soil is more easily moved. So that diffusivity is combining both characteristics of our geomorphic agent and its tools, as well as as properties of the earth material itself. Okay, so it's it's combining material properties and process properties, if you will. All right, it is 11:50 according to this clock.
So that is all. We will talk more next time.